evening, everyone, and welcome to Scale Hats Alumni Tech Talk Series. I'm your host, Amina Sadiq. And for those who don't know me, I am a senior business analyst and IT consultant. Um, I am also a senior course instructor here with Scale Hat, and I'm thrilled to have you join us for this exciting episode of our Tech Talk series that goes live every Tuesday at 6 p.m. EST, um, bringing you inspiring stories and valuable insights from our talented alumni. So tonight we have a truly special guest, um, and I'm gonna be bringing her on stage shortly to introduce her. Give me one moment. Hi, Shade. Hi, hello everyone. Welcome. So we have a truly special guest today, an outstanding Skill Hat alumni who has navigated the challenging journey, you know, from going from customer service and non-tech role um, to landing one of her first ever tech jobs in the United States, um, where she's now a top earner um, in her field. So welcome, Shadai. Shadai's journey is definitely a testament to her determination, her hard work, and just the transformative power of learning and upskilling. And I think a lot of us, especially myself, you know, we kind of went through this phase of upskilling, learning all these new skill sets, and it's really transformed our lives. So we're going to delve deep a little bit today, and we're going to talk about Shade's um, experience. Welcome, Shade. Thanks for having me. All right. So maybe we'll start with, can you just briefly tell me, introduce yourself um, and share you know, your experience, your educational background, um, and some of your professional background before you got into tech? Yeah, of course. Um... Hi again, everyone. Uh, before I got into tech, my educational background, uh, I literally just had a high school certificate, just a diploma. Yeah. Um, and um, so no real professional certification at all. And um, most of my experience was in customer service. Um, that's usually over the phone, um, customer service, as well as um, in person. And yeah, that was what I was doing before. Okay, so like, what motivated you, motivated you to get into tech? Like, what was that motivating factor that was like, yes, let me join Skill Has and let me get some some skill set going. Um, so what had happened was I lost my job, so I got laid off. I was doing a customer care job, and I got laid off after four months of starting that job. And I knew a friend who knew Mo, and he was telling me, hey, my friend, he does this program. I think you would love it, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll do it, whatever. But I was really taking it serious until I lost my job, and I was just at home not doing anything. And I was like, let me reach out. So I reached out to Mo, and um, I started a course like that. Friday. I reached out maybe like a Tuesday. I started the course on Friday. He told me about the BA course, and I said, I'm interested in that program and I started it on Friday and after the first session honestly I was sold I was like yeah I like it because <laughs> I had a lot of transferable skills doing customer service and talking and so problem solving so right. I was like yeah I, I I can do this and that's how I got it of course and that's really what really helps us because our skill set outside of tech really helps us within tech, right? Um, customer service role being one of them, right? So we have a lot of skill sets like communication, documentation, things that we've learned outside of the world of tech that have really helped us in this world. Um, so let's first kind of get into what motivated you to seek a job in the States? Like, why not Canada? Not Why not somewhere else? Why the States? Well, so I do work in Canada um, and I'm still working in Canada. Okay. What happened is um, I feel like the market here is just a bit smaller. And whenever like you see like a job ad being advertised and you're like, oh, I am going to apply. I have like five, six other friends who are BAs as well. And a lot of times we're looking for jobs at the same time. They're like, oh, yeah, I applied to that one, too. And a lot of times there's just so much, a lot of crossover going on, right? And I'm like, uh, the market, it's it's almost very small, especially in Toronto. So yeah. it's like, what can I do to enter into a bigger market where, you know, I can compete? And I was like, I'm going to look over the other side. And 
that's what I did. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely can relate with you because I myself was like, the job market here is not good. So, I, you know, I got a job in Chicago and I'm like, yes, this is amazing. At least I can broaden my horizons because a lot of us, you know, we're a very small group of people. Right, we are all because we're all in Toronto, we're all in yes. Canada. But from the job market perspective, you're absolutely right, it is a little bit smaller. And sometimes I even tell some of my students, like, Hey, be different with your resume. You really don't want to like be sending a resume that looks like everybody else's, right? So I have this thing where I'm always changing my resumes, but no, that's really good. So, um, could you walk us through the key steps that you took? Um, to secure your job in the U.S.? Like, what were some of the things that, you know, you did to, like, obtain, like, a work work permit? Did you get a lawyer? Like, what was that experience like for you? Yeah. So um, let's talk about um, the work permit first. So basically, if you are a Canadian citizen, you can, as long as you have a job offer, you can get a TN visa, and that visa lasts, like, two, three years. I'm not a Canadian, so I didn't qualify for that. I'm just a permanent resident. So for me, what happened is that my mom, my mom is a citizen of the of the U.S. And so with my mom being a citizen, um, I also had a green card through my mom. And so that's how I was actually able to get uh, to be able to work there. Basically, I don't necessarily have a work permit. Um but I did a lot of research um, and I know like for permanent residents, uh, if you're not looking to work like as a contractor, if you're just looking to work as like an employee, just get a regular job in the U.S., you can. A lot of companies, they do offer like a H-1B visa to Canadians. You just got to let them know like once you're applying that you're in Canada and they'll be more than happy to sponsor you. Because when I was looking, I did come across a lot of companies asking, hey, do you need sponsorship? We're able to do it. Um, so that's a, that's another way. And yeah, if you're Canadian, you can actually, once you have a job offer, you just go to the border. You don't even have to you just go down, drive down to the border. You yeah. actually get it the same day. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. And there's so many ways to kind of like get your um, your your TN visa. Um, there's different categories that you can apply to if you don't even have like a degree in like computer science. The H1B one is actually a really good one as well. But that was really great that you had that green card because that definitely speeded up the process for you. Because I, I know how painful the, the work visa can be, especially going to the States. So that's really good. Um, so perhaps maybe what were some of the challenges that you encountered during your job search and the and just kind of like not necessarily relocating because I know you said that you work you know, primarily from Toronto. Yes. Um, but what were some of the challenges? Did you face any challenges at all? I did. Um, there were, I came across a lot of challenges. So for me, what I wanted to do, so see here in Toronto, most of the contracts that I work on is like an incorporated contract. And I wanted the equivalent of that in the U.S. So I, I just wanted to work as like a contractor, a consultant, right? And so with that route, I one needed to set up a business in the u.s so that was one of the first steps like so getting a business registered there and um just trying to research uh what would be like the best day to get that business registered in now i know it's like wyoming um so that that posed a lot of challenges as well i had to consult like um with like a lot of people there, like accountants, and I had to pay for it, of course. So just getting the business set up, it's a, it can be a lot. And once you do get the business registered, you also have to get like an EIN number. So that would be like your tax number. And so that posed, I had to wait maybe like four weeks before I could get that. Um, and then once that was done, then you have to go set up a business bank account and you have to do all of that. So that posed a lot of, um, I would say that, it was a lot of challenge getting all of that done before I could even start looking. I had to get that um, done. So that was a bit challenging for me. And the next thing I would say that would be that was challenging was finding the contract. So because, again, I want to work as a contractor, the contract that I want to work on, is called a C2C contract. And I'm using LinkedIn and I'm using a platform called Dice to look for these jobs. And to be honest, it's not a lot out there <laughs> when you're looking for C2C contracts. It's not a lot. So you have to be digging and um, reaching out to companies directly 
And um, it was very time consuming. Yes. yes, absolutely. And I wanted to chime in there. So for a lot of you guys that are on the call, we're hearing kind of what you know Shade is mentioning. Shade was able to get a job um, as a green card holder. So I can chime in there for those of you who are on the call who um, don't have a green card. Um, essentially, you would still apply um, naturally as a you know a consultant here, and the same process would apply to you, and you would pay your taxes just like you would you know here in um, here in Canada, but you would just be paying be paid by the company in um, America. So that's just to chime in. Shade, I think I lost you. Are you there? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm still here. Okay, perfect. So I don't hear myself anymore. Okay, perfect. That's good. All right. So I um, just wanted to kind of just to throw that out there for the people who are on the call who are like, oh, but I don't have a green card. What do I do? So that's just some information for you as well. And I know that Shade also has additional information she can share, um, you know, at the end of the call. Um, so let's move moving on to job searching strategies. I know that you mentioned um, that you use Dice and you've used other job um, searching you know, tools. Um, what strategies and resources did you leverage um, during your job search to the United States? Yeah, so for me, it was mainly LinkedIn. I, um, my current job, I got it through LinkedIn and Dice. Those were the two platforms that I used. But the trick that you have to do with LinkedIn, um, so you, you basically will probably need to create another profile and you will have to change the address just to get on that side. So the U.S. recruit, you have to use a U.S. address so that the recruiters in the U.S., when they uh, try to pull like the specific keywords, then your profile will, you know, pull up so they can reach out to you. If you still keep your Canadian address, the likelihood of a U.S. recruiter reaching out to you is quite slim. So one, you have to change your address. And for me, I still wanted to search in Canada too. So I just created a second profile. And the tip that I that I use is that um, my Canadian profile, it's Shade Reed. It's like my full name, right? But like with my other profile, I just did Shad Reed. Still me, but I just changed the name. So just in case they put Shade, you won't pull my Canadian um, LinkedIn and be like, who is this, you know? <laughs> exactly. No, that's that's a really good idea. That is a really good idea. Sometimes I'll just like turn off Toronto and I'll put like oh, yeah. the area that I want to. But even still, when your resume comes up, they're like, "Oh, you live in Toronto." Yeah, <laughs> those are really good. Those are really good tidbits. Um, so, can you share some tips or insights as to how you um, perhaps maybe effectively networked to find? Any job opportunities? I know you said you use LinkedIn. So did you just use LinkedIn job search? Or did you, you know, besides using LinkedIn or Dice, did you actually, like, you know, go on to, like, you know, people who are in the U.S. and probably network with them? Like, to talk about that networking experience for yourself. Yeah, I did not do a lot of networking. Um, I should have, but I didn't. One of the reasons, too, is my LinkedIn profile is fully optimized. And I think that's where a lot of people... Um, struggle you have to fully optimize your LinkedIn and because I did that I didn't apply for even most of the jobs that reached out to me the job I have now I didn't apply for it's the recruiters they were the one flooding my inbox reaching out to me hey we have this we have that and so um, that's what I always ensure that I do just to make sure my and update it regularly so every day I'll go on it uh, I'm not changing anything I'm just just resaving it so it shows like if I did an update, you know, just to keep my profile fresh and at the top of the list at all times, um, as well as um, just making your profile look very attractive. You know? Definitely, definitely. Putting the candle down yes. down of your bio, I was like, this is absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so moving on from kind of the job search, so now landing the job. So could you provide some details about the interview process for that U.S. role? Um, did you have to actually go in person at all? Have you met them in person at all? Or has everything just been, you know, remote? Yeah, all of my job search has been remote. I did not need to be in office for any of it. Um, However, I would say the culture is a bit different over in the U.S., especially when you're doing interviews, because I realized that I did about I did a few interviews before I landed one. And I think it's I had to, like, 
tailor my interviewing approach you can't really come on too strong you see here in canada like they'll appreciate you having you know showcasing your knowledge and just going on and on about it like in the interview i feel like when i was interviewing with the us it's more of a relaxed approach um that's just my experience <laughs> you just have to yeah pull it back a little bit but still get your point across um and so yeah Oh, no, that's really good. So in terms of the interview process, you said that there was a bit of, a bit of interviews. So how many interviews did you have? Well, I would say in terms of like solid interviews where you're like, yeah, this is like a great prospect. I'll probably say maybe like seven. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah, I had like seven um, that I did. And of the seven, I think three gotten back to me with a no. Um, yeah and then i had like four different offers but okay. all of it was like at the same time so i didn't have the capacity to do like two or three i, I could only do one at a time so okay so would you say that like over the course of your journey you were applying you applied for like seven different obviously you applied for many companies but seven of them got back to you you did seven different interviews three of them was a no and then the others were yes. Yes, yes. So these yeses, did they come at once? Or the two came at once, and the other two was maybe like um, two months after I got the first offer. Oh, okay. So you were still interviewing after you got your first offer, which is smart, <laughs> which is a very smart thing to do. I tell all of my students that I tell you know everybody that I know like keep applying, keep applying, keep applying because. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of roles out there for us to, you know. Yeah, people. I'm never not looking. I'm always in the market. It just depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> it, it, definitely, and I, I can I can relate. Um, so in terms of, okay, so there was a question that I had. So in terms of you um, accepting, you know, the offer, so for, for that particular interview that you had, was it just one interview that you had and then they decided? Because I've had an experience, like, with my current um, US company, I interviewed, like I had three different interviews and even one of them, I, I was in person. So I'm just kind of trying to gauge, like, I'm yeah, I know. <laughs> so I'm trying to gauge, is that the same experience that other people who've worked in the US have? Because I think it was a bit overkill. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a, a bit of an overkill. Yeah. Um, no, I, well, thank God, I did not have that for me. Mm -hmm. uh, all the interviews I've done was just like a one on goal. And, it wasn't like a lot of people too. It was maybe like two persons max in the interviews. Um, yeah, I must have been lucky, but <laughs> yeah, you yeah, yeah. definitely because usually I'm some, sometimes I'm finding that I have like a panel, <laughs> like yeah, there's like five people or like four people. You have to do a presentation, so I'm wow. glad experience was and that was my and and what I love about this conversation is that we all have different experiences. Yeah. Like, Talk to one person who was like, oh my God, it was like hard to like break into the, the US market. I would say it's pretty easy. It's you know, easy. Yeah, pretty easy, yes. right? So everyone yeah. has their own experiences. And I think for those on, for, on the call, I want you guys to know that everybody's experiences are different. And so you really just need to like, you know, listen, gauge, you know, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. And then, you know, try to get your own experiences and see, you know, what works for you or what doesn't. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about um, preparation for the interviews. How did you prepare for the interviews, especially considering the international context? I know that you're in Toronto, but like, well, how did you prepare? Did you prepare the same way or, you know, keeping in, in consideration the fact that, again, the U.S. might interview a little bit differently or their style of interviews are a little bit different? Have you feel like you kind of channeled your approach when it came to preparing for interviews? Yes, um, I did channel my approach. I find that um, a lot of times when I inter when I do interviews here in Canada, uh, they're really focused on your skills and just wanting to um, learn about your background and your behavioral as a BA. That's usually what they want to know about. But in the U.S., I had to prepare because... Um, and for this is for all of the interviews. They ask you like about the company, like so. Hey, tell us about um, what do you know? Why did you want to work here? And I'm like, okay, um, <laughs> that's from Toronto because they don't really ask. Like I, 
in Canada here, they don't really ask. I've been to several interviews and I've been only asked like three times, oh, tell me about the company. And I'm like, oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. And they find you on LinkedIn too. Like a lot of times when I'm about to interview, I'll see the person who's supposed to interview me. I'll see them on my LinkedIn. So I go back on their LinkedIn too, just scan through, see like what they've, yeah. what they've done over the years. And I try to incorporate it just a little bit into yeah. the interview just a tad i'll be like yeah and i know you've been in the industry for this many years you know yeah that's a big well, that's a that's a good one i know a few people that have pulled out that card like hey i looked you up on on linkedin right but i know that <laughs> west like they are really it's like the linkedin is like their facebook and instagram yes. they are all on if you don't have a linkedin it's like what it's like you're a ghost like they don't trust oh, you they don't trust that's you like it's standoffish yeah yes. <laughs> they don't trust you you do not trust yes. them don't have a picture or profile or you know your school on your on your linkedin doesn't have a logo you're like oh who's yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh god that's good that's good okay so um now kind of moving from the job preparation let's talk about like adapting now that you got the job so walk me through the process so walk mm -hmm. me through the process of you know you got the job offer um i'm, I'm sure it was very seamless for you because you have like the green card um, but can you just kind of walk me through your first week and then your first kind of like, you know, 60 days? How was that for you? Like on the job? On the job. Or... Yeah. So like walk me through the process of they've given you the job. They said, hey, Shade, you're amazing. We love you. We want you on board. Just walk me through the process of like the three months after that. Yeah. Um... I would say it was pretty good. It was pretty smooth. Uh, again, I do have experience as a BA, so I know. Um, and it's a, the industry is healthcare, and I have worked in healthcare. So it wasn't a lot to um, the learning curve, I would say. It wasn't like a big curve. I, I was able to catch up to what they were doing pretty smoothly. Um, one thing I'll say, though, to always just be aware of it, and it happens within the three months. And I they do it here. They do it here, but in the U.S., they do it like a lot. It's called a G check. Well, that's what I call it. Oh, that's what I've heard it's called. And so they'll basically throw things at you, but not. It's it. It comes very. Um, it's very. <laughs> You, you don't know that that's what they're doing unless you know that's what they're doing. So it, they'll say to you, my boss came to me, right? Like maybe in week, um, maybe week three. And he'd be like, oh my God, today we need a BRD. And oh my God, we need it by Friday. And today's Tuesday. But I know it's it's actually called a G check, and what they're trying to do, they're trying to um, size me up. He's trying to see if I know what I can, if what I say I can do, if I can actually do it, right? And so that was, and they come at you quite quickly. They usually give you a very tight deadline, and it's actually just to assess your skills. I mean, yeah. I can create a BRD in my sleep, so I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so I confident, I love it. Yes, <laughs> I was able to do it, right? And then they came again with another one. And this time, I think it, he wanted um, he wanted some type of um, a guide, some type of training guide around the system. And I don't even know the system. I'm new to your system, so you want me to create a guide. So I kind of know that you're just trying to feed me out, but it's okay. Um, you got to be aware of it. They do it a lot, um, and it's usually within that three month period. I, I can't tell you exactly when, but they'll usually throw a task at you with a very short deadline. Uh, just be aware of it. It's just to size you up and see if you, what you say in the interview, if you can actually do it. They don't do it a lot here, but they do it a lot in the U.S. Oh, they definitely do it a lot in the U.S. They definitely do it a lot in the U.S. So sometimes I just, you know, because I know that. And you know what? I think the good thing is, is that you had experience before, you know, joining the U.S. company. Um, I would believe it would be quite challenging if you never had a role before. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, join you know a company in the states, brand new. So it's definitely a good thing that you have that experience. Yes. Now you talk about some of the experiences that you've had. Let's talk about the cultural experience. Um, what do you think your major kind of um, challenge to do in terms of the company. We've talked about a lot, but what was the, the major one? Um, I think one of the major things I've noticed with the U.S. culture is there's 
there's not a lot of work-life balance, um, I realize. So sometimes they expect you to work long hours and sometimes they'll email you at 6 a.m. in the morning. I, I, I mean, I start at nine, but they'll just send you random tasks at random hours. You don't have to do it, but sometimes it, it just makes it, they send it in a way where it looks bad if you don't like respond immediately or, or, or acknowledge it in yeah. some ways. Um, and they'll, they'll say it to you, they'll be like, oh my God, I sent you an email, did you see it? And I'm like, yeah, but I, I mean, you send it at 9 p.m. So yeah, I've seen it, but okay, you know, and things like that, it, it, it won't be a big deal to anybody else, right? And they're, and you're just, I'm not used to that here in Canada, we do have like work-life balance, everything is, clear cut. Um, so I find that was a bit different as well. And um, I don't want to say too much, but again, I, I, I'm, I'm black and I'm a woman. I don't want to hear too much. <laughs> say too much. That's why we're here. Yes, I'm you're black and you're a woman and you're powerful. Woman. You're killing it in tech. Yeah. So that's all. So, yeah. So, yeah. So I get, but you know what? I can relate with you in the sense that I have to actually ask my manager. I'm like, do you not like, do you just not like, do you always work? Um, they assume email sometimes at 12 a.m., sometimes at 5 a.m. I'm like, no, these people are working around the clock. There is sometimes the work. Yeah, it's like the work becomes their identity. And I don't relate with that. Like, I'm Shade outside of work. So. Of course. Of course. Okay. So my last question for you before we start taking some questions from the chat is um, what advice would you offer to others about navigating and thriving, um, you know, in a new culture, especially kind of like even navigating the tech space and getting into um, the U.S. market? What would be some of your advice? Um, in terms of navigating the culture? Navigating, nav I think what I'm asking is just navigating the whole, you know, getting a job in the States, navigating the culture. Like what would be your overall, um, I guess, advice to somebody who wants to break into tech, especially in the States? Yeah, I think one thing that's key is consistency. Um, because w especially when you're trying to break into something new, a lot of times it's not gonna happen overnight, it's not gonna happen today, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. Uh, it might take you a longer time. And so you have to, if you, this is what you really wanna do, you have to stay consistent at it, especially in the face of disappointment. A lot of times when you're applying and you're getting those rejection emails, it can be daunting and it can be demotivating. But um, I always just tell myself, it's part of the process. I have to get a few rejections before I can get um, those offers that I'm looking for. Um, so I find that I'll say, don't don't let that demotivate you when you're getting them. And in terms of the culture, it's quite tricky, but I would say this, um, these jobs, they pay a lot. And um, because I know that, um, I'll be whatever you want me to be, right? <laughs> Absolutely, that's that's great. You you don't need to know my real personality. I have my work personality. Right? Yes. No, that's absolutely. Thank you so much for that advice. Thank you so much. We're gonna get into some of the questions in the chat. There are a few. I just my focus was on the beautiful Shade and just making sure that you know we get through some of the questions, the hot and burning questions that we have. But I'm gonna um, take it to the chats and I'm gonna pull up some questions, okay? So let's go. Um, all right. So Swapana Menon says, is there any particular resources or websites other than LinkedIn to find companies who sponsor visas for Canadian citizens? Um, I'm not sure of any other website, but I mean, there are other, com there's a lot of companies who do it, but they're on LinkedIn. Like, for example, I think it's called jobs, jobs to jobs, like jobs and number two jobs. That's another one that sponsors Canadian and, um, <sighs> Canadians who want to work in the U.S., that's also another site. But again, all of these sites are on LinkedIn. So what you can do is um, put that in LinkedIn and you'll find a host of um, companies comes up that do it and you can just reach out to them directly. 
or just call, email them if you don't want to do it through LinkedIn. Yes, no, it's yes. not for you. And also, also going online and just doing a generic job search, that's what actually helped me get my job. I just did a whole just internet job search why for you know, EA roles in the States and I just applied. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next question is from are there specific skills you must have before employers hire you for a BA role? I think the regular, yes, there are certain skills that you must have to be a BA. And the first one I would say, and the most important one to me is like communication. You got to show that you're able to communicate effectively. Like we're having an interview. I can talk to you. I can articulate my point. Uh, if you're especially written communication, you need to send emails a lot and talk to people a lot. So just get make sure that those skills are like good and documentation. I mean, you're a BA, you can be documenting a lot. So your communication, your documentation skills, you have to have it. There's there's no going around it. Definitely. And facilitation skills. And facilitation skills. You know how to like talk to people, get information and jot it down while still engaging them. That is a skill set. <laughs> so that's definitely one. Thank you so much for making that question. Okay, so another one that we have here is, oh, this is good. This is a good one. All right. Jayla Rose says, how did you optimize your LinkedIn? How did you optimize your LinkedIn? Your LinkedIn is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, uh, so it's not it's not hard to do and linkedin actually helps you a lot so if you go on your linkedin and you go to your profile usually there's a little bar and it will tell you what percentage of your profile is completed you just got to make sure you get to 100 and i know it can be daunting because they want you to fill out everything but that's exactly what i did i have a cover photo i have a photo i have a tagline i have um my skills my certifications my experience um i also reach out to my friends to give me recommendations hey send a recommendation over on my page like every single um category that's on your profile for me is fully filled out and that's how you fully optimize it as well as the keywords what do you want to work in if i want to be a ba every single keywords around a ba the business analyst business system analyst a process analyst every type of analyst scrum all of that keyword <laughs> is <laughs> yeah it's on my LinkedIn some way. So you 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 have to find me. Yes, yes. And your your bio, your description alone and talking about the key points of each job and what you did and what you were able to deliver to that company was I, I actually use your um your LinkedIn as a case study for some of oh, yeah. I'm like, hey, you want to optimize your LinkedIn? I use most. I go I sometimes on mine, I use yours to show what it looks like. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to actually um, put another question up. Okay. So, okay. Um, Kelly says, sorry, I think I missed this part. Do you get paid as a contractor? That's a precise question. And then, do you get taxed in the US and in Canada? How does, so, explain the taxes. How does that work? Yeah. So, I keep my taxes separate. Um, so, technically, again, um, I wouldn't pay any taxes in Canada because I'm using a U.S. address. It shows that I live there, but I mean, it's a remote job, so I can live anywhere. But no, um, I get paid in my U.S. account, and that's a business account. And so the taxes that I have to pay, it would be um, like a federal tax for a corporation because it's a corporation. My business is a corporation, so I have to pay corporate federal taxes. And um, you know, a lot of times you also have to pay state income tax. But my, my company is registered in Wyoming, and so they don't have a state income tax for a corporation. So, okay. I, you know, I... I, I get a little tax break there <laughs> uh <laughs> and um for myself i think for me i'll just pay myself as a 1099 contractor and so i decide how much i'm going to pay myself and that's what would get taxed to go to the IRS. oh amazing so okay just to answer your question um from a canadian perspective you actually have to pay your taxes in canada so if you're a contractor or consultant in the States, you just have to make sure that whatever they're paying you, you're taking into account Canadian taxes. 
and then you are remitting your taxes back to Canada. So they utilize my incorporation number and they pay my incorporation and my Canadian business account. And then I get taxed in Canadian. When I when I do my all my taxes for the year, I'll file file here in Canada. All right. So let's go on to questions. All right. So Jamil says, do you have any BA specific certifications? And if so, would you say um, those set you apart from other candidates? I do not have any BA specific certification. I think a lot of times it looks good on your LinkedIn, but in terms of setting you apart, no. In my experience, a lot of times it's usually like a nice to have when they send you like a job requirement, your certification is listed as a nice to have, not a must have. And so, I mean, it's still on my profile, but I just don't have it. But I don't think, I don't, I've never heard anybody ask me like, can I see? I mean, I'm, I have a, a project manager certification um, and no one has ever asked to see it ever. Yeah, I have an ECBA certification as well and nobody's ever asked to see it either. Um, so they're nice to have. They look really good on LinkedIn, but when it comes to the actual job, unless it's an actual requirement of the job for you to have your PMP or they cannot hire you, it's a stipulation. Typically, these certifications are really nice to have. It shows that you are expert in that field and you have the information, but it doesn't mean that somebody who's working 10 years as a BA and somebody who's been working 10 years as a BA with a CBAP, there, there's any difference. It's just, it's just the certification that just makes it look good. Okay, um, so I'm gonna take two more questions because there's not a lot. Um, this is a good one. So Jayla Rose asks, how did you learn about BRDs? I took the skill hat program. Yes. <laughs> yes, you did. And if you take the Skill Hat program, um, the business analysis course that we offer at Skill Hat, you will learn how to create BRDs as well and a plethora of other temp, um, um, deliverables that BAs provide. All right. Um, thank you. So then I'll ask another. This is another good question. Where is the best place to learn business analysis? There are so many courses and programs, which which ones do you recommend? I can only recommend the one that I did, to be honest. And I, I took one program. Again, I was working as a customer care representative and I took one program and that was the BA program with Skill Hat. Well, sorry, I also took their project manager um, program as well. But I took the BA program and that's what landed me in tech. Um, I know there is a lot of other programs, but to be honest, I can't speak on them. I don't know. Uh, but I think if I'm recommending you to a program, I'd recommend you to the one that I took. And that was with Skill Hat. Yes. Um, so just to kind of chime off of what Shade said is that the business analysis program is one of the best courses to take, especially if you're trying to break into tech as a business analyst with little to no experience. But there are additional, there's product manager, the product, product manager class, there is the project management class, um, there's our accelerator that we provide um, through the business analysis course that gives you actually hands-on experience. So, you know, those are some of the courses I would say that you would, you know, that those are courses that I would take. Um, and I teach it. So you get to see me every Saturday and uh, Monday, Saturday and, and Monday. So yeah, so that's definitely one key one. Um, okay, so we'll take one last question. And then perhaps maybe I'll, you know, open the floor to you, Shade, if you have any, and you know, anything else you want to kind of talk about. Um, so this is a good one. Kay Kasim is asking, how do you manage two different LinkedIn accounts, considering they would have the same info, face, et cetera, and do you have them both active at the same time? That's a good question. It's actually not hard at all. Um, what LinkedIn does is, so once you have two profile and you sign into them regularly, um, 
a lot of times when I'm signing out of like my Canadian profile and I want to sign back in, it displays the two um, profiles to me and will just ask me which one I'm trying to sign into and I'll just click and it'll allow me to sign in. It's actually easier than you, you think. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's a feature of LinkedIn because they know people will do that, have multiple profiles, um, but it's, it's quite easy to manage. A lot of times though, um, I find that when I get an email, um, when I'm looking at an email, like from a recruiter, sometimes I get confused, like who they're talking to, like which profile is this? So that's, but because I know which email is for which profile, I can always just say, oh yeah. So that's the only time I may get confused a bit. And yes, they're both active, um, but it's very easy to manage. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering. I know that a lot of I know a lot of people who actually manage two different profiles, um, and it, it's absolutely fine. Sometimes you have different you know jobs or different skill sets that you have, and you want to use one page to promote you know business analysis. Um, I'm also you know I, I've done project management. Usually I put them together, but if I if I'm doing customer service and I really like you know branding and marketing. I might even create a separate LinkedIn for that. So there's nothing wrong with having two different um, LinkedIn pages, but you probably just like, you know, should I mention, you want to make sure that you kind of change up the names a little bit. So you're, you know, you're not obviously having an overlap there. I know that I said we only have like one more question, but there are a few that are coming up and I'm like, these are good ones. And I know we have up until the seven o'clock um, mark. So I'm going to bring a couple more up if you're okay to answer. Are you good? All right. So this question is really good. Um, Jayla Rose asked, how did you um, make your resume or how do you make your resume stand out in such a tough job market? I think um, with your resume, you have to, uh, there's a word that Mo will use and I think it's called um, quantitative skills. Uh, so you, you have to talk about um, the things that you did for the company that um, helped them to succeed, right? Yeah. So you got to change up the way how we normally do or profile where it'd be like, oh, I led, I led this project or I worked on this BRD or, you know, you got to change it, change the language in which you do it. Like I created a document that... Um, you know, it became like a major part of the project and it helped to, it was like the key document that helped to the project to completion, something like that. Uh, I'm just having a little brain fog, but you got to spruce it up a bit. Um, move away from just the regular way of I led this or I helped with this, I assisted with that and try to show um metrics in a way i i helped a company increase their project output from maybe uh 20 percent to 80 percent you know and the, a lot of times I, that's on my resume <laughs> and a lot of times it comes up in the interview they're like how did you do that Tell yeah that, you know <laughs> That's definitely definitely one thing I learned from Mo, and I actually changed up my resume quite a bit. Um, so, in terms of like quantifying yours, yes, I, I I moved away from language that said, you know, I ran a data migration project to I was success I successfully uh, migrated fifty end users onto the new platform. Right, that showed that okay, I'm actually showing the amount of people you know, I've been able to kind of help through this migration. So it's just really to show like what your key, you know, successes were. So changing up wording a little bit, key successes, what were some of my achievements? Like those are some of the things you want to put in your resume. But thank you so much for answering that. Okay, so um, there was a question that I had, I had here, and sorry, I don't have my glasses on, so I'm like looking in the screen literally. Um, okay, I think we answered this before, but I'm going to, you know, put this out here again. Um, so Martha's asking, I um, thanks so much. This has been quite an informative session. Um, in case this has not been addressed, do you need a green card to work in the US? So just for those who came a little bit later, um, Shade will, will answer that. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay, so she's asking if you need a green card to work in the US. Uh, no, you don't need a green card to work in the U.S. Um, you just need a work visa 
And um, again, if you if you are a Canadian citizen, um, you're in a very good position because Canadian citizens, you do as Canadian citizens, you do qualify for what is called a TN visa. And for the TN visa, um, as long as it's a job in tech, right? Um, you just need that job offer. Just apply for any job, and once you have the offer in hand, you can actually get the visa at the border. It's I have a couple friends who have done it. It's actually quite simple. Um, I mean, you don't have to go to the border. You can apply online, but I find that it's just easier. You get it the same day. You drive there and, you know, show them your offer and you get it. It's, it lasts for three years at, at a time and then you can renew it after. If you are a permanent resident, I think one of the... Um, go after an H-1B visa because as permanent residents, uh, you don't qualify for the TN visa as yet until you're a citizen. So the best one to go after would be like an H-1B visa. And there's a lot of there's a lot of companies out there that um, help you with H-1B visa, like provide type sponsorship. Or I've, I also came across a company who, um, I don't know what they can do, but they can help you get it. Yeah. Um, they're, they're legit. And so if you're really interested in it, that's a way to do it. Um, there are other ways, but. There are, definitely, there are definitely a lot of, um, there are definitely a lot of like law firms that also can help with that process as well. Um, so, and I'll probably just kind of add some of my experience. So like for those who don't have a green card. So I, I don't have a computer science degree, but I still am qualified to use a TN visa through another stream called i believe it's called the scientific analyst now it sounds funny because you're like how are you a scientific analyst so if you are working under a manager who has an engineering degree or a computer science background you just leverage your manager's degree to say hey i'm working under an engineer or i'm working under um, somebody who has like a background in tech and I'm going to be supporting them to do their work. And that actually helps you. But I was only able to kind of identify all of this um, only when I you know, got lawyers involved. So that's definitely something that um, is to, to speak for, that there's so many different ways to kind of maneuver yourself. As long as you're determined and willing to kind of work in the States is definitely something that you, you should look into. Okay, so the last question I'm going to put up is, what, and so the last question I'm going to put up here is, um, Okay. okay, Tolu Ikujumi. She says, is it a drawback to not have US experience or is Canadian experience sufficient? Your Canadian experience is sufficient. Before working in the US, I did not have any type of US experience. So I just used the companies that were on my, on my Canadian resume. But a question that came up, they did ask a, a lot of times, uh, a recruiter will be like, and that's because again, they do go to your LinkedIn profile and they do look through. So they'll ask me, um, all of your companies, they've been in Canada. Like, and I'll be like, yeah, I, I'll be like, I used to live in Toronto or I'll just be like, yeah, I live in Toronto. Um, but because it's a remote job, you know, or I find myself saying I, I do back and forth a lot. So that's why, um, but no, it's not a drawback to answer your question. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for answering that. So I'm going to take this question. So it says, can you provide info about um, the course and fee? Okay. So I'm going to try to give you guys an offer today. And I'm going to actually link it to a banner, um, you know, a little bit after this. Um, so we're going to do an early 100. And this is for all of the people who want to sign up for the BA um, class that starts um, October 21st. Um, if you register in the next 24 hours, you are going to receive um, $100 off of that course, and you're going to use the code EARLY100. So I will link that in the banner momentarily. Now, um, with that said, if you do want to land a job as a BA, just kind of what we've been talking about in the past, the past hour, um, and you're interested in business analysis, or you're interested in project management, Scrum, um, you know, just kind of learning the ends of tech and you just want to get training, hands-on experience, mentorship, and build a network of alumni such as, you know, myself and Shade and um, a lot of other people who have taken courses with Skill Hat. I want you guys to reach out to Skill Hat and book a call with us. So if you go to skillhat.ca 
and you go to roadmap, it'll show you your roadmap to, you know, becoming a business analyst and entering the world of tech. And so that is skillhat.ca slash roadmap. All right. So that's just that. Now, Shade, I know we only have a couple more minutes um, to wrap up. So did you have anything, you know, lastly that you wanted to kind of mention on the call? Anything you wanted to ask me? Any, you know, just any any last words? Um, yeah, I, I just want to mention, I know there might be a lot of unanswered questions about um how to work in the US, especially for those who want to work as a contractor. Um, so you can, uh, I have created an ebook with that walks you through step by step, like getting a job, how to get it, and um, setting up your company, how to do that, getting your bank accounts, the best banks to use, all of that. Um, so I have compiled all that information in the form of an ebook. Uh, and so if you are interested in purchasing that ebook, I, um, I don't know. I think we could put the link in here somewhere. But yeah, it's a very good read if you want to work in the U.S. as a contractor. Um, All right. Do have any other questions? No, that's amazing. That is amazing. It was an absolute pleasure to interview you. You definitely motivated me. Um, I'm glad that I was able to pick your brain today and I'm glad that we were able to actually answer, you know, some of the questions that um, our, our, our audience had. Um, so again, for the audience, go to skillhat.ca slash roadmap. If you do want to break into tech and enter the world of business analysis, if you're more interested in project management and other, you know, product management, there are so many other um, courses that we offer. Again, we are giving a hundred dollars off to the people who um, register within the next 24 hours. And the, um, the code for that again is early 100. So early in capital letters, 100. All right. Thank you guys so much. It was a pleasure. You guys get back five minutes of your, your evening, but thank you guys. It was a pleasure. All right. Bye.